Let's go. Uh, so, uh, good morning. My name is Yasmin Silvia Portales Bachal from the Western University. I want to uh, give thank you to Marisabel, Ted, Susan, all the wonderful people that have set up this seminar in the Accra Campus 24 annual meeting. I will be speaking about and going with what we spoke yesterday for the relation between uh, science fiction, Cuban science fiction, and dystopia. So the title of my presentation is uh, Cuban Made Socialist Paradise, How Cuban Science Fiction Tried and Failed to Imagine Socialist Utopia. So uh, let's start with a quote, very famous quote by Oscar Wilde. A map of the world that does not include dystopia is not worth glancing at. For a very long time, and for, and for some people still, Cuba is that place of utopia in the planet, uh, along with North Korea and China. So I'm not sure it's good, but uh, in the period that I will be speaking about, between 1959 and 1989, I believe that it was, honestly, for a lot of people, a real utopia, a place where to find hope, a place where the best of the best was happening in a third world country. This speaker is by Calore Santos and Ico Freire, Jose Martí, and the two of black, the name is Resguardo de la Nación. And I want to bring it up because part of the point of Utopia in Cuba and his literature is related with this idea of Cuban exceptionalism and the preeminence of poetry and imagination in, in our nation and in our political history. So <clears throat> this is today again, a little bit of history. So the dissertation dilemma, which will be presented like a big bang theory chapter. Mm -hmm. Then the memento, which is history, like a Nolan mm -hmm. film. Then the Odyssey, like a Konchalovsky miniseries. And then clandestine, like that Fernando Perez film that a lot of people cry for. And finally, Cloud Atlas, like the promise from the Watch of Peace Sisters. So, the dissertation dilemma. Uh, the dissertation dilemma has four parts, four subchapters. When I seek to write my first project of my dissertation seven years ago, when I was applying to Northwestern University, I wrote, I want to write about family, family and sexuality in Cuban science fiction using three books. Espiral, by Agustín de Rojas, 1989, 1982, Fábula de una huella extraterrestre, by Daniel Chaviano, 1988, and Havana on the Water, by Eric Mota, 2010. Part of the mythology of the academia is that while you go through your PhD, your dissertation project will change tremendously. My didn't. I was pretty sure I want to write about these three novels, and I keep writing about these three novels. What changed was the way in which I was seeing them, and the way in which I realized I have to explain these books and their singularity to other people. So, therefore, the introductory conundrum. So, why I have to explain to other people, people not familiarized with science fiction or Cuban literature or Cuban politics, why these three books are important, are like the three more important novels in Cuban science fiction, being a spiral the best of the best. And why the, the story see the necessity of writing science fiction from a place that it wasn't the present of Latin America in each of those moments. Cubans were living in the future. In many occasions, when I try to explain my political or imaginary origin, I say I came from the future. We were living in the future of the world, in the socialism, and we were constructing communism. And a lot of what was right, paint, film, lyricism, uh, and discuss in Cuba or about Cuba is permeated by that phenomenon. The imagination that time has structured again in Latin America, and it's not only what Alejo Carpentier described as 
many times past and present living is also the future shouldn'tly living in the Caribbean. And then the philosophical inevitability. Why are these people writing something that is not laudatory or ethic? Why they are not writing what the party wants they do write? For what purposes they are writing? My take is that they are writing for the revolution, not for the party. And this brings us back to yesterday's discussion about what communist party, right? So, ah, uh, memento. So, now we are going to make an experiment. Uh, just this, you have, uh, this time we have 15 minutes each because there are four people. Just so yeah. I'm time uh, you, okay? Ted, please take your phone, mark two minutes. Okay. Yeah. You remember Memento? Christopher Nolan movie? Yeah. This guy forgot everything that happened after some time. So now we're going to do that. Two minutes. Yes. So in the 60s, science fiction was uh, published in Cuba suddenly for the first time in massive amount. The first book published, the first science fiction book that widely circulated in Cuba was uh, Death from the Cosmos, a uh, Soviet Union anthology in 1963. Several more books were published, print by Soviet Union, and later Eastern Europe publishing houses and published by Cuban houses. But the point is, that most of what was published was socialist or communist science fiction and the classic of the genre of the first part of the 20th century. Javier de la Torre, which I'm quoting here, make the point that a lot of what is the best of the best in the 50s and the 60s in the Anglophone world is not published in Cuba until later. We are speaking, um, and this reveals some political agenda. Yes? You got another 50 seconds. I have another 50 seconds, wow. So the point of this is that is being introduced to the public an idea of what science fiction is supposed to look like. Yes? Cool. 30 seconds. Uh, no, could it? Oh, okay. So now, close your eyes, close your eyes. Forget all of this. Let's start all over again. In the Soviet Union, at the beginning of the Social Revolutionary Revolution in October 1977 and 19, uh, a group of intellectuals dream about writing the new art, creating a new art for the new society. So we are speaking about Mayakovsky and the Futurist. We speak about the suprematists, and of course, we are speaking about the first professional science fiction writers. The problem is that these guys not only spoke about the future, the luminous future, about the, com the world domination of communism and advance of technology, they start to speak about the problems of implementing communism in the Soviet Union. They became uncomfortable, problematic. Realism, socialism is the solution for that. These guys, were, we, most of us know what happened to Mayakovsky. He killed himself, and all of, many of them end up in gulags or in psychiatric institutions. In 1960s, in Cuba, something similar happened. A group of intellectuals find out that they are living in the future. They are changing the world. In 1962, we are like the people that almost go make Kaboom the world. So we are definitely in the center of the world, and therefore we can speculate about the future. But they not only speculate about the future or reject by technology methods uh, the evils of capitalism, they start to critique what is going on. And they become uncomfortable. Okay, not gulag, but silent yet. Okay, close your eyes. Let's start all over. <sighs> so, according to Javier de la Torre, what happened in the 60s in the 70s is what happened at the end of the 60s, specifically, according to some in 1971, uh, is that uh, the, the science fiction disappears from the editorial landscape. He claimed that it's not true. What happens is that Cuban science fiction stopped of being published. But 
foreign science fiction is published in great quantities. Javier de la Torre's theory that I, that I support is that there was a process of substitution. Cuban science fiction had become comfortable, uncomfortable, therefore the publishing houses were forcing the hand of the fabricating a taste, an acquired taste, of what real science, socialist science fiction should look like. Yes? Uh, that's why after 1971, between 1971 and 1977, non-Cuban non -Cuban science fiction is published, and uh, we have a lot of Soviet science fiction, some good, some bad. The Odyssey starts in that point. In the 70s, well, in the 70s, in the 60s and the 70s, a lot of people is fighting for the control of the discourse in Cuban culture and Cuban politics, and while Padilla and other famous intellectuals have Cortázar or other famous intellectuals screaming and defending them, Cuban science fiction writers didn't have anyone to defend them because it was in gender and because they were like no one. Therefore, they have to go on the ground and leave the long silence of the 70s by their own. Some of them didn't survive until the end of the Quinquenio Gris. Others leave the country, and some of them start to write again in the But this period is also the period when most of Soviet science fiction is published. Therefore, my generation and people that have like 50 years, like yours, it will be formed in system, their sensibility with Soviet science fiction. So, what happened in the 80s? The younger become more comfortable, and more fallible to the government, yes? Uh, in the words of Yoss, it transformed itself to, to achieve the publication which is the goal of everyone, in theory at least. So a lot of Cuban science fiction published in the time is pretty much a remake, bad remake, of Nebula Andromeda by Efremov, which is considered uh, like the point, the highest point of uh, Soviet communist good science fiction utopia. Uh, and this is an example. Trenko, Bato Etra, 1986, is, is an awful book. But it was super popular and it was people in the years and years. So, how do we get to utopia from this point? My theory is that some people, despite all this, believe in utopia and try to make utopia in science fiction. How do you prove uh, for uh, the benefit of academia and reification of knowledge that this is going to happen? This is happening. By reading Frederick Jameson and Jose Esteban Muñoz hand by hand and watching them rip apart. <laughs> so what follows is uh, hand by hand, quotation and confrontation between the two of them. So let's start by Toledano Redondo, who claimed, who claimed in 2002 that for him, and again, the, the explosion of Cuban science fiction is related, deeply related, to the idea of utopia uh, taking place and staying in the Cuban imaginary. We are living the utopia, we are living in the future, we can produce, we can do this. We can speculate and critique and critique technology and science. So what I'm going to look for in these three books, and in general in Cuban science fiction, is the utopian two books. Like the interwoven idea of a different or better future or possible. Yes? So in chapter two of Archaeologists of the Future, um, Jameson claims that utopian the writers, utopian writers, uh, where political text or hermeneutics are always uh, being maniacs and dogma. Jose Tea Munoz literally answered this claim, uh, uh, affirming that no, that whoever writes an utopia is in reality a revolutionary, and a queer revolutionary. In fact, because it's making the bed 
that the only way to save himself or herself and humanity is to collect this uh, action. Utopia is a social project, always and first of all. So collective futurity, the notion of futurity, that social of historical materialistic critique is what constitutes utopia for current economy. So, and this is the point when, where I see specifically a spiral. Jensen comments, again going to Ofremo, uh, that um, the clash between communism and science fiction only produce propaganda like Ephremo uh, and Romero Nebulosa. Jose Esteban Munoz reminds us that communism is not Sovietism, that the point of communism is emancipation of freedom and the possibility of achieve what we are all mean to be. From that point on, I think communism like what it ought to be, maybe, and not what the Soviet Union makes it for polar culture. Therefore, and this brings me again to Espiral and sexuality, and especially to Fabulas de la Huelesta Terrestre, with their polytheistic and incestuous feminists that nevertheless were published in 1988 in Cuba, uh, is the point where Jensen claims that maybe utopia is only, is precisely in everyday life. And he quotes there to Roland Bartret, the top is in the quotidian. No, maybe, but it is important to remember, claim Jose Esteban, that the point of utopia is to reject the presentism, to believe that something better can be achieved. One phenomenon that Cubans believe is the idea that we were living in an utopic time and therefore there was no future. Future was not important. What we were doing was the sacrifice that worked everything. And that point in which you remember that future can be something different may be liberatory. So, okay, Jasmine, your time is up. Okay, conclusion. So maybe maybe um, you can continue at the end of the discussion. Uh, no, this is the last slide. This is the last slide. So, uh, the point will be, uh, by the end of the 20th century, with the fall of the Berlin Wall and the, and, and the arrival of the internet, how queerness can be represented in science fiction through cyberspace. And how uh, Havana on the Water show us different families and people that can literally redesign themselves through the resources of the internet. Therefore, my thesis is, that Cuban science fiction writers didn't write utopia because they honestly believe in revolution in the end of their heart. If you believe that reality can be improved, you don't have to write utopia. You have to write critique to fiction. Thank you very much.